Greetings, everybody. We're going to talk here about coronary revascularization, and this could just as easily be under the heading of coronary artery disease, except that I'm not going to talk about the medical management so much here, but I'm going to talk about the surgical management. But it's impossible to talk about surgical management without talking about medical management to a degree, because we always try medical management before we jump into surgical management. So uh, we'll briefly talk about uh, the, uh, the, the medical management, the decision-making tree, um, and then we'll go into uh, the two major revascularization surgeries, which are percutaneous intervention, PCI, and coronary artery bypass grafting, uh, CABG or CABG. Uh, and then I'll briefly talk about postoperative care. So just to look at the anatomy real quick, uh, because this can be important on the test, not as important as your decision making, but uh, it can show up. Uh, so where would it make sense for your coronary arteries to come off from? You've got oxygenated blood. Where is it going to come from? It makes perfect sense for it to come from the very place that's right next to the heart where we have oxygenated blood, and that is the aorta. So the aorta is often, and I say often because there are anatomic variants, the aorta is oftentimes the, uh, the uh, genesis of the left and right coronary arteries. And the, the left and right coronary arteries, often called the left and right main stem coronary arteries, uh, are the, uh, the, the precursor arteries to all of the, uh, all, all of the coronary arteries. So let's start on the right here. Uh, and this is not including all of the coronary arteries, just the major ones. So you got your right coronary artery, and your right coronary artery splits into your right marginal artery, which comes along the uh, along the inferior uh, and medial uh, border of the heart, and then goes wraps around the heart, uh, and that's going to be your posterior artery, posterior descending artery. So right coronary artery, right marginal artery, posterior descending artery. Your left coronary artery uh, gives rise to two major arteries. So it comes off on the left side here. You've got your left circumflex, which you can think of as circumflex circling around, and that's what it does. It circles around at the posterior uh, part of the heart. And the left circumflex also gives rise to your left marginal artery which just like the right marginal artery comes along the margins of the heart if you're looking at it anteriorly. And then the big daddy of all the arteries of the heart, the left anterior descending artery. And this is the artery that is most often affected when somebody has the massive heart attack that they die from suddenly. So this is the big one. And this, is, this artery is actually one that you can't do uh, you can't do a uh, angioplasty on, so we'll talk about that later. But this is this is a big deal. So the left anterior descending or interventricular artery comes off of the left coronary artery, and then there's also a diagonal branch off of the left coronary artery, and that's uh, another minor artery. But these are the I would say that these are the uh, seven that you would want to know before any of the other ones. There are other coronary arteries, uh, but I would know at least at least uh, left coronary, left circumflex, left marginal, right coronary, uh, posterior descending, and right marginal. All right. So this is a, an angiogram. So this is pretty much the same view as we saw here. So uh, we've got our right coronary artery coming up here and the right marginal coming along the, uh, the, uh, the inferior and medial surface of the heart here, and, uh, and then the uh, posterior descending artery here. And I, this angiogram, it didn't show any, uh, it didn't show what the view was from, so I'm kind of guessing here, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Uh, if anybody thinks I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. Um, Okay, so here's, uh, here's your posterior descending, and then you've got your left anterior descending here with your left marginal down here coming off of your left circumflex, which circles around the back to supply the left posterior heart. Uh, on the USMLE, I, it's, I've seen angiogram pictures come up before, but I've 
I don't think I've ever really seen it to where you need to actually make a diagnosis based solely on angiograms. Uh, just because you'll never get an angiogram on a patient that you haven't already gotten an EKG on. Okay, so any patient who needs surgery on their heart is going to need it, uh, when we're talking about coronary disease, is going to need it because at some time or another they had the symptom of angina. Angina is chest pain with exertion, but it's a particular kind of chest pain. It's a substernal chest pain. It's described as crushing or heavy. Remember, chest pain has a huge differential. This is a crushing and heavy pain. This is not a burning pain like GERD might be. Um, this is substernal. It lasts minutes to hours, not days to weeks. So you have a patient who comes in with pain that's been lasting days to weeks, prob certainly not angina, uh, unless it's been multiple episodes. So days to weeks is probably something like costochondritis, uh, where it's a muscular pain rather than actually pain from the heart. And then sometimes with angina, there's an associated radiation to the upper arm or shoulder, usually the left upper arm or shoulder, but that does not need to be present to qualify the pain as angina. So with angina, it's always chest pain with exertion. So there are different kinds of anginas, and mostly we're concerned with uh, stable and unstable. With Prince metals, I talk about that in the uh, cardiovascular section. So uh, that doesn't have anything to do with doing surgery, so you can go back and look at it there if you want. So with stable angina, it's angina, chest pain with exertion, but when the patient sits down, it goes away. Maybe not right away, but it, it goes away. It gets better. So chest pain with exertion relieved by rest. Stable angina. Unstable angina is chest pain with exertion that's not relieved with rest. So you can see why that would be, that would trigger red lights in your head because it's not relieved by rest. Something's going on here. This patient is resting and they still have angina. This can also be defined as chest pain that's new because we don't really know what it is uh, or chest pain that's worse than previous episodes of their stable anginas. But what you should really know is chest pain not relieved with rest, unstable angina. So stable versus unstable. And angina itself, just uh, with the exception of Prince metals angina, angina means coronary artery disease uh, until otherwise specified. So that's the, this is the disease process that's behind this symptom, 99.9% .9 of the time. Okay, acute coronary syndrome. Now, this is another term for angina that isn't stable, or in other words, unstable angina. Acute coronary syndrome. Acute meaning that it comes on within minutes to tens of minutes to hours. Coronary, meaning it's affecting the coronary arteries. Acute coronary syndrome is basically unstable angina or heart attack. Unstable angina itself is unstable angina. It's not a heart attack. However, if a patient has what we think is unstable angina, they may have a heart attack. So there are three things when we talk, when we think about uh, acute coronary syndrome. It's un there's unstable angina, which by definition is not a heart attack. Then there's NSTEMI and STEMI. Those are the two different kinds of heart attacks. So in order to figure out what kind of acute coronary, coronary syndrome the patient has, if it's unstable angina or if it's a heart attack, we have to get an EKG. And that is the best first diagnostic step in a patient with unstable angina. With the EKG, you should also get cardiac enzymes. That's going to help you diagnose whether or not it's a heart attack. And you should also give the patient aspirin or clopidogrel if aspirin is contraindic contraindicated. Uh, and you should give them a beta blocker or a uh, calcium channel blocker if a beta blocker is contraindicated. You should also give them a nitrate and supplemental oxygen. So this is sort of your, uh, your cocktail for the, the patient with a uh, possible heart attack. Aspirin, because it's been shown to increase survival uh, if taken in the early stages of a heart attack. Beta blocker, because it's going to reduce the, the demand of the heart muscle for uh, oxygen 
by slowing down the heart. Nitrates relieve the pain, and then the supplemental oxygen also will help with the pain. So the aspirin and the beta blocker are what increase survival. Nitrate and supplemental oxygen, those help with the pain. The treatment will vary based on the EKG and enzymes, which we got for diagnosis. Now, the enzymes tell us whether or not it's an MI. If you don't have elevated enzymes, you don't have an MI. You just have unstable angina. The EKG helps us determine whether or not it's, well, of course, it could tell us if it's not a heart attack, but if you have elevated enzymes, the EKG is going to tell us if it's an NSTEMI or a STEMI. So an NSTEMI is just occlusion of a vessel. STEMI is total blockage of a vessel. And what STEMI and STEMI stands for is uh, STEMI means ST elevation MI. So if there's ST elevation in your EKGs, we're not going to look at EKGs here. Again, it's in the cardiovascular section, uh, but uh, that's how you determine it on EKG. And STEMI, there's no ST elevation. STEMI, there is. And to know that it is either an NSTEMI or a STEMI, you look at your enzymes. If you have elevated CKMB, you have a heart attack, an MI of some kind, either NSTEMI or STEMI. Okay, hopefully I've made that clear. So if enzymes are positive but the EKG is equivocal, then treat it as an NSTEMI. All right. So let me just clear this up again in case that it's confusing because you really have to have a good handle on this to know what we do for surgical therapy. So STEMI, NSTEMI, WTF. Both cause cardiac enzyme elevation. So they're both heart attacks. Both are life-threatening emergencies that require treatment because they're causing, uh, they're, they're, they're both causing uh, infarction to the, uh, to, to the myocardium. Uh, and then both can be anterior, posterior, lateral, inferior. You're going to diagnose that based on your EKG. So you need to know how to read your EKGs. We're not going to talk about that here. So they have a lot in common. What are they different? The STEMI is a more severe occlusion. So this is more severe. They're both life-threatening, but STEMI is more severe, um, and it's, it causes a transmural, full-thickness ischemia of the myocardium. It's a much more severe occlusion, usually a complete occlusion. And this results in an ST elevation in the relevant leads, depending on what artery is being occluded, whether it's an anterior, lateral, inferior, posterior, or MI. In this case, with STEMI, fibrinolytics are useful. So th that's why knowing the difference between these is so important. With NSTEMI, this is the non-ST wave elevation MI, this is a blockage that causes just a superficial ischemia of the myocardium, which may but not always result in ST depression, which is the opposite of ST elevation in the relevant leads. And fibrinolytics here are not useful. We don't use them for NSTEMI. So definitely got to know the difference between STEMI and NSTEMI. All right, so this is just kind of giving you a visual. I use this in the, in the cardiovascular section, just a visual of how these terms, what these terms mean. So angina is everything, stable uh, angina, unstable angina, even Prince Metal's angina. And then uh, the un under unstable angina, you can have a non-MI. If it's not an MI, then it's just unstable angina. If it is an MI, it can be NSTEMI or STEMI. And all of these are acute coronary syndromes. So acute coronary syndromes can be just another word for unstable angina. And all of these, though, even stable angina, are due to coronary artery disease. Prince Metal's angina is the only one that's not, but it's not in this diagram. Okay. So what is our algorithm? If it is unstable angina or NSTEMI, then uh, what we're going to do, of course, is order EKG and enzymes. Uh, and then if there's no ST elevation or if there's a new left bundle branch block, which I talk about why that happens in the cardiovascular section, it's not important here. 
then we're going to go ahead and administer aspirin beta blockers uh, as well as heparin and then supportive care. Uh, now, uh, what was I going to say here? Uh, okay, uh, on the USMLE, if it asks you what's the best initial step in management, I would say that the answer is aspirin because that increases survival. EKG doesn't increase survival, it just helps you with diagnosis. But anytime you have a patient with unstable angina, you wanna give them an aspirin because that's gonna increase their survival. If, and we're concerned about making sure the patient survives. If we can, we can diagnose the patient all we want, but if the patient dies, we didn't do our job. So if, they, if the question asks, what's the be best initial step in management, it's aspirin. If it asks, what's the be best initial step in diagnosis, well, of course, then it's EKG. And the best, uh, step in, uh, the best step in therapy would be, of course, aspirin, too. So in real life, of course, you're doing all of these kind of at the same time. But you want to order your EKG and enzymes and then also administer these drugs. So aspirin, beta blockers, heparin, and uh, supportive care. Uh, with supportive care, we're pretty much just treating their pain. Okay, uh, so if, uh, now we're assuming that they don't have ST elevation here. Uh, if the enzymes come back positive, or if the patient develops any, during the process of it, any symptoms of hypotension, which would show severe cardiac uh, effect, uh, uh, if they have chronic kidney disease, uh, prior in intervention, or if they have very prolonged pain despite the supportive care, uh, then we're going to manage them surgically. So what do we do surgically? Well, the, t the answer depends on the time since onset. So if it's been less than 12 hours since the pain started, we will do angiography and percutaneous intervention. And before we do percutaneous intervention, we give a GP2B3A inhibitor and clopidogrel. If it's been more than 12 hours, or if the patient has gotten P uh, percutaneous intervention but it's failed, then we do cabbage, which is the open heart surgery. And we'll talk about those more in detail. Now, if the patient if the patient has enzymes that are negative, then we diagnose this as unstable angina and we don't need to do anything, technically. All right, now, what if it's STEMI? So we've ordered the EKG and enzymes, and we see ST elevation or a new left bundle branch block. Now we're going to, of course, be, be administrating the aspirin, the beta blockers, the supportive care, and we're going to get them ready for surgery. We are going to do surgery on these patients. If it's been less than three hours since their pain came on, and they don't have any contraindications to TPA. And you should know what the contraindications are. I'm not gonna go over them every time we talk about TPA, but mostly it's if they've had any major head injury, if they've had recent, very recent surgery. Um, if it's been less than three hours since the pain came on, you will administer TPA to the patient or an equivalent. Usually, uh, it's usually TPA, but streptokinase is not preferred because you can develop immunity to it. Um, so TPA. Um, if, if, uh, if it's been less than three hours, you're going to administer TPA. If, uh, if they respond to it, then good. Within tw you're going to keep them in the hospital. Within 24 hours, you're going to do percutaneous intervention. If you can't do TPA because it's been more than three hours or if they have contraindications or if the TPA doesn't work, then you're going to do percutaneous intervention immediately. If that fails, then you're going to do cabbage. Now there are, uh, there are uh, exceptions to whether or not you're gonna run forward with PCI and cabbage and we're gonna talk about that now. So percutaneous intervention, what is this? So basically what this is, is you put a catheter in, usually in the femoral artery and you run it all the way up. So you're going femoral artery and then uh, external iliac artery and then common iliac artery and then aorta and then all around the aorta into the heart. 
and you're going to shoot die into the heart, and you're looking at the, uh, the, the vasculature of the heart with an angiogram, and you're looking to see where the, uh, where the, the problem is, where the blockage is. And usually you kind of suspect where it's at based on your EKG. This is nice because it's less invasive. You don't have to cut the patient open other than making this little uh, incision where you put the catheter. Uh, and if the patient has a single vessel disease, then you can treat the patient with this percutaneous intervention by putting a stent in. And this is really, really, really nice because there is there are problems with cutting people open. That's going to have more. It's going to have higher mortality. The patient's going to be in the hospital longer, etc. So if the patient has a single ves vessel disease, percutaneous intervention is the best thing to do for them. Now, you can't definitively treat them with PCI if they've got a multi-vessel disease or if the disease is in the left main or left anterior descending artery. And that's why I said those arteries are so important. So if the patient has left main or left anterior descending arteries, you can't treat them with PCI. You can look at the heart by putting the catheter in, and usually you do have to, but these patients do need cabbage. Also, if the patient has multi-vessel disease, they're also going to need cabbage. So PCI is better for single vessel disease when that vessel is not left main or LAD. PCI is better than drugs for unstable angina. It does increase survival there. Uh, and the ser there are serious risks for PCI as there is with most surgeries, especially when you're sticking a catheter into the heart. Uh, and those risks include stroke because anytime you, you're kind of passing through arteries that may be, uh, especially when you get to the aorta, there, there may be plaques. Uh, you can dislodge some of those plaques and they could travel to the brain. So you can cause stroke. Uh, you can have uh, VFib, VTAC, various arrhythmias. You can cause an MI. You can get a postoperative MI. Uh, and then you can cause aortic dissection, and you can cause uh, an allergic reaction to the contrast that you're injecting. So those are some of the serious risks. They're not tremendously common. Uh, so this is, in, in, this is overall a safe surgery to do. So big thing, though, is better for single vessel disease, except for the left main or LAD. You cannot do this for multi-vessel disease. And all you're doing here with percutaneous intervention when you're going in, I'll show you here actually, you're, you're going in and you're uh, with, with the catheter, at the end of the catheter you've got this balloon and then you inflate the balloon and that's going to make some space in between this plaque, which the plaque is what's causing the problem. And so you create this space in the plaque and then on the balloon you've got this stent that you're going to leave in there. And that stent then is left in there and it keeps the plaque separated. So now you've got this canal for blood to move through. And you can see why it's, you can't do this for, for uh, multi-vessel disease because you're going to need to go in with multiple, uh, multiple catheters and it just becomes much more uh, tedious at that point and we just would prefer to do cabbage. So I can't, I can't stress enough you got to know this. For PCI is only for single vessel disease, except for left main or LAD. In that case, if you just have single vessel disease of left main or LAD, you're still going to do cabbage. And then this is a coronary angiography. Uh, this is showing here's the left circumflex artery. This is a lateral view, so that's why it doesn't look exactly where it should be. And you've got about 80% uh, blockage of the left circumflex artery. And this is just one artery disease, left circumflex, so we can, this is perfect to do PCI in. And this is after the stent, so much better perfusion. Okay, cabbage is also known as uh, what lay people call bypass surgery. So this can be double, triple, quadruple bypass surgery. All that means is that we're bypassing X amount of vessels. So it doesn't necessarily mean how, how sick the patient is. You can have a sicker patient who's getting double bypass surgery and a less sick patient who's getting quadruple bypass surgery. So people might come out and say, I got quadruple bypass surgery and people's jaw drops. That doesn't mean they were super sick. I mean, everybody's sick who needs this, but none of this pertains to how the degree of sickness that they have. 
So uh, this is just how the lay people refer to it as. So if you've ever heard bypass surgery, this is what that is. So coronary artery bypass graft. What you're doing here is you're going to take, uh, you're going to salvage a, a vein or an artery, uh, oftentimes the saphenous vein in the leg or the radial artery in the arm, and you're going to use that artery to create a bypass for the heart. So those arteries in our arms, our legs, they've got plenty of, of, uh, of uh, there's other arteries and other veins that that part of our body can use. Uh, to maintain perfusion. So we can do without those. We can't do without our coronary arteries. So we salvage those and then we use them for our heart. And you can see here on this picture, and you don't need to, you don't need to know this for, for, for the test, but just to give you a visualization, you can, uh, you can bypass the, uh, the LAD by connecting uh, an artery to, uh, to, this looks like the uh, subclavian artery, uh, uh, just connecting it to one artery to the next one so that you've got uh, you still have blood flow so you're getting blood flow from your left subclavian to your left anterior descending so you're just creating you're creating a new road where there's too much traffic and in this case they're taking it off the aorta and putting it onto the uh, the right coronary artery so uh, very creative who are the patients that get cabbage these are patients with multivessel disease, as you know, because we can't do PCI on them. Patients with disease of the left main coronary or the LAD, we can't do PCI on them. Or patients who get PCI and they fail. They, their symptoms continue after their PCI. Those are the patients we do cabbage. With cabbage, it's more invasive than PCI, and so therefore it carries a higher operative risk. However, long term, the definitive outcomes are better than PCI. So short term, a little more risky, long term, better survival. The complications, there are a ton. So pretty much every heart problem you can imagine, uh, you can get operative, post-operative, MI, hemothorax, uh, pretty much every, uh, every uh, ventricular fibrillation, atrial fibrillation, uh, uh, VTAC, pretty much every heart problem you can imagine. Uh, then uh, also pneumothorax, hemothorax, uh, pleural effusion. Don't worry about all these complications. Uh, just know that pretty much every cardiac, uh, cardiac disease that you can think of can happen as a complication from this surgery because you're literally opening the patient's uh, chest right up and touching their heart. Um, and then any of the complications of general surgery. So tons of complications. And this is why in the short term, it's kind of tedious. But once the patient gets out, uh, the long term, uh, the survival is better. So here's another uh, example. So here we're taking the saphenous vein and we're putting it on the aorta, stitching it onto the aorta and then stitching it onto the uh, left anterior descending. And so this is very, very, very creative, but it takes a very experienced surgeon. I have a lot of respect for them. I would never in my wildest dreams think I could do those kinds of stitches there. It's incredible. As far as caring for them post-operatively, they all need to be administ uh, admitted to the surgical ICU or whatever ICU you have avail available. And then you need to have them on telemetry because they're at risk of said uh, fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, and so we need to uh, make sure that we're monitoring them because you can go into V-fib and die really quickly. So we want to make sure that uh, nurses are monitoring their, uh, their, their EKGs at all times. Uh, be vigilant of symptoms of MI or stroke, especially in older patients, just because this is such a uh, common complication. And then one big thing here that you need to know for the USMLE uh, is that you need to monitor their ejection fraction and their uh, pulmonary, or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is pretty much just another name for your uh, left atrial pressure. And we do this with a Swan-Gans catheter, which is... Uh, I don't know, the nurses insert these. I, I think they're put down the uh, 
carotid ar artery, uh, and they go down into the left heart, and then they, they measure the pressure down there. Basically what it is, is it's measuring the pressure of your uh, pulmonary veins. And that's a surrogate for measuring for pulmonary hypertension. So what we're most concerned about postoperatively is uh, the, uh, the stability of their heart and its ability to pump blood out. And in addition to that, uh, as a consequence to that, whether or not they have pulmonary hypertension. So if you have an inability of your heart to pump blood out, then you're going to develop pulmonary hypertension because the blood gets stuck in the heart. So we're very concerned about this uh, in the short term. We want to make sure that this uh, that the patient doesn't develop congestive heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, and the uh, PCWP is how we do that. Uh, so we can uh, measure this via the uh, ejection fraction, uh, which is usually done. Uh, usually, you're going to need to do a uh, echocardiogram to measure that and. Normal ejection fraction will not be given to you on the USMLE, but it's uh, between 0.55 and 0.60. Any, anything that or more is a normal ejection fraction. So I would just say better than 55%, fine. And then the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury. Now this is kind of an interesting one because you may have a patient who's got a... Uh, a, a, a showing symptoms of low perfusion, uh, hypotension, and uh, you might think from that, oh, it's CHF. You need to know their, uh, their PCWP. If it's low, then they're not getting enough fluids. If it's high, then it's pulmonary hypertension. So 12 plus pulmonary hypertension, 8 minus, uh, it's going to be low fluids. So you should know that you've got to uh, monitor the, the, uh, their ejection fraction and uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure post-op. All right. So the take-home points, uh, surgical intervention is undertaken when there is unstable angina not responding to medical management. Usually this is in the context of an, of an MI, but not always. There are times where PCI is uh, is done uh, is, is done uh, preventively. Uh, there's been a study on that, so you might see that out uh, in in practice. Um, so this is usually in the context of an MI. Technically, there needs to be 70% blockage to qualify for an intervention, but with unstable angina, there pretty much always is. Know the diagnosis and treatment algorithm, which I showed you. Uh, and then know how to suspect lateral versus anterior versus posterior versus inferior MI based off your EKGs. And that's addressed in the cardiology section. Know when uh, or if to do a TPA. Uh, TPA is done only in STEMI and only if it's within three hours and only when there's no contraindications, absolute contraindications. Uh, know when and when not to do a PC, PCI. You do not do a PCI if there's multivessel disease or if there's disease of the left anterior descending or the uh, left coronary artery. And then know when to do cabbage, which is pretty much when PCI fails or they're not eligible for PCI. Any questions, let me know.